Welcome. My name is Andrew Miller. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for ABG Business by Avast. Today I'm joined by Ken Shaw. I'm looking at the registration list, and I see that over two-thirds of you attended part one of this three-part series, so uh, thanks for coming back. A third of you are brand new, so you need to be introduced to Ken Shaw. Now, Ken uh, has built a career, and he's built a huge company based on protecting business data. He fully understands that the value of that data that the business lives on and how to recover from any kind of disaster that might strike that data. Now, if you wish to see part one, it has been recorded and a link will be provided to you. This uh, part two is also being recorded and a link will be provided after the webinar. But the main theme for part one could be summed up in a song that uh, Ken identified by Cher. And it was, if I could turn back time. So with Infrascale, you can turn back time. You can get your data back to the last dependable set of data that drives your business. Today we're talking about servers and ransomware coming to a server near you. And if I could just preempt any kind of guesses from Ken, I would say that today's thing could be summed up by Joni Mitchell by saying, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. So Ken is going to take this webinar away and he's going to talk to us about ransomware coming to a server near you. So Ken, please take it away. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, yeah. uh, what, what a great introduction. Uh, couldn't agree more. Um, good morning, everybody. I guess good, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, if you're joining us from Europe. Um, I'm Ken, as Andrew said. My, my details are here on the screen. Feel free to reach out. Uh, also, Ken Shaw JR on Twitter. Uh, we you know, really like to engage with, with partners and prospects and folks interested in this topic in general. Now, at today's webinar, we're going to have a, a, a giveaway. We try and make these things as interesting for you folks as we can. So the way it works is there's a Q&A widget in the On24 platform, and you can use this to ask questions throughout the session. At the end of my presentation, we're actually going to have a dedicated Q&A, which is in an Ask Me Anything format. So feel free to ask me or the, the AVG guys anything you like. And we're going to be giving away a prize to the person who asked the most questions. Questions need to be on point, so they need to be about security or data recovery or backup. Um, and you can even you can start asking them now, frankly. So um, you know, find that questions widget and, and do ask questions, and we'll announce the giveaway at the end, as you can see on screen, that the prizes uh, include a, a Parrot drone, an Apple TV, and an Xbox One. And uh, I've got all three of these toys, and they're fantastic fun. If we look at the agenda for today's webinar, it's going to take a similar structure to the previous webinar, uh, in that first we'll, we'll sort of look at some some deep content around ransomware, and today particularly we're focusing on how ransomware attacks your businesses, and that in particular can mean targeting the server in your environment, as Andrew alluded to. Then we'll talk about the tools in your toolbox to, to help you know, rescue a client from a ransomware attack, which generally means either a backup solution or a DR solution. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the modern variants of these two technologies today, being both cloud backup on the one hand and then DRAS, it's called disaster recovery as a service on the other hand. In sort of chapter three, we're going to look specifically at some resources that, that uh, AVG and Infrascale together are providing to all of their partners to help with the education of customers um, and with selling the services into customers to help them you know, prevent and then recover from ransomware attacks. And lastly, I'll tell you about Infrascale. But before we do all of that, we are going to uh, we're going to ask you a question. So this poll, hopefully this poll is on screen. Um, and um, what we're just asking you here is whether or not you or one of your clients has already been infected by ransomware. Um, we, we'd like to gather this data and we'll share it out afterwards. So if we can ask you to sort of put your coffee down, lean forward, and um, and pick an answer, that would be super useful. And I'll leave that up here just for a few more seconds. All righty, let's see what we've got. Goodness, okay, 93% of people on the line have had one of their clients infected by ransomware. Um, that's both good and bad. It's good uh, for the purposes of this webinar because it means that a lot of you are familiar with the pain involved here. It's awful as it insofar as it represents the state of small business computing on planet Earth right now. Um, I'm not surprised that the number is so high. Ransomware has become you know, the most common, quote, disaster, unquote, that we're facing 
in IT. All right, so the, the title of today's webinar and sort of chapter one of this presentation is all about how ransomware targets the core of your business, right? Here we say targeting the server. It can even go beyond that. Um, but there's uh, several sort of trends that are pretty concerning in ransomware. We'll talk about how payloads get distributed in a few slides time, but sort of three meta trends want to call out. The first one is that the sophistication of the phishing attacks, the sophistication of the distribution methods that, that are being used is really escalating. So for example, earlier this year, uh, there was an, an Amazon branded email that went out. And the email was spoofed, of course. It wasn't really from Amazon. But it went out and it was perfectly rendered, looked exactly like an Amazon you know, order receipt. And I do a lot of, I buy all my groceries on Amazon. Uh, and I was fooled by its presentation. Um, I wasn't actually targeted by it, but when my staff showed it to me, I was very impressed by the quality of the replication. But of course, this was a fake email and it went out to 100 million people. And we, we don't know how many people fell prone to the attack, but by clicking on the link in the attack, you were then taken to a, a website where an exploit kit was was installed on the web server. So basically just by going to that website, your computer could be infected, right? And so sort of two really big concerns there. The first is that just the sophistication that these people are bringing towards the phishing attacks. And the second is that it, it, can, it can be as easy as just driving by a website to actually have your computer be infected. And then the second major trend called out here on this page is the pivot that ransomware purveyors have made from targeting home users and consumers towards targeting businesses. So we're here in Los Angeles, and, and one of the most common, uh, commonly cited ransomware attacks actually was here in LA uh, at the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, who recently had to shell out $17,000 to uh, an unknown ransomware attacker to unlock their data and, and resume business operations. And so, you know, the bad guys have clued on to the fact that a business will pay geometrically more amounts of dollars to resume operations than will a consumer. Furthermore, different types of businesses will pay even more. So banks and hospitals, you know, these types of businesses are going to sometimes pay almost any amount of money to be able to resume operations if they're not properly protected. And the last trend, the network effect, really goes to the heart of today's topic because modern ransomware kits, uh, things like Locky, things like server, are network aware, which means that they can detect if a laptop or if a workstation is connected to a network, seek out network shares, seek out resources like database files, and specifically attack those. The programmers behind these kits have figured out, hey, look, usually that type of data is going to be more valuable than just you know photos or Word documents on a local laptop, so let's go after that. Um, and so if we, on the next slide here, we've actually got a screenshot of one of these kits that are available out there. So ransomware has become such a big business with more than a billion to be paid out this year, the experts say, um, that you've now got people selling ransomware product kits. So if you were to cruise around on the dark web and search for it, you could find web pages like the one here in, in the screen capture. Now the screen capture is not, not super easy to read, so let me just highlight some things for you. First is this is, you know, this is a page on a hacking website or a forum uh, where all of the tools that you need to be to run a ransomware attack are being sold. Right now, the price here is at 500 US dollars or 4.99, and you can see it's it's being promoted as if it's a legitimate piece of software, which is kind of crazy. Um, they're touting things like their cross-platform support and their agile development methods, much like a legitimate software company would. Uh, they're listing all of the exploits that are that are already built in and its ability to update itself. So this is, I mean, this is all of the tools that someone, you know, if someone wanted to set up a ransomware attack, they can get all of it right here for five hundred dollars, which is quite scary, right? That the, that that is how low the barrier to entry to to becoming a ransomware purveyor is. Uh, and there are, there are a bunch of these, right? This is just one that we've sampled. So probably two things to draw your attention to here. The first is ransomware has clearly become a big business, right? If we've gotten to the point where 
rogue software development teams are building product to actually sell product to enable this thing, uh, which is, and when I say this thing, I'm talking about what is a criminal enterprise, then you know it's a big business if it's gotten to that point. Um, and the second point is, you know, how, what, what that's doing to the proliferation of these attacks. The reason why we're seeing thousands of new attacks going on all the time is because almost anybody who's so inclined can go and get one of these kits, set up a command and control server, and actually start running their own ransomware campaign. And what that means is it, it means that the networks here aren't being, these aren't, it's not like we're dealing with two, three massive players that, you know, maybe law enforcement could track down and shut down. It's not like that. Um, it's not even like some of the major worms and, and viruses of, of past decades where, again, with one critical patch to the operating system or with an update from your AV software, you could be protected. This software is polymorphic in nature. It's changing the way it presents itself to the, to the operating system. It's changing the way it behaves so that heuristics built into most security uh, products you know, have trouble tracking it, all of which means it's... You know, it looks like thousands of different threats instead of, you know, one threat. It's much harder to pin down. Now, if we actually sort of walk through how one of these ransomware variants can infect your network, uh, we've got a bit of a flow chart here. Let me just walk you through it. The first one is always access, right? So just like any virus, they've got to find a point of ingress into your network. Now, that's nearly always your end users and your endpoints. So we spend a lot of time in, certainly in, data, in the data protection world, focused on protecting the centralized assets, protecting the servers and the databases. Um, but it's really endpoints where ransomware enters your network. And that's why folks like AVG has spent so much time building such great endpoint security products, right? So AVG, you know, yes, they've got products for your servers, but critically, they've got products you can run on all of those end-user computing devices, laptops or workstations, because this is where they're usually entering. Um, it, it nearly always, ransomware nearly always comes in as a payload through a phishing attack via email or perhaps with, um, you know, website. There's been some recent attacks uh, that where messages are being propagated through the Skype network. I actually got one of these messages recently. Um, but the email or the Skype or whatever you get generally encourages you to go to a, a website. And that website is an exploit site. It's not going to look like it, but it means the web server is running code that knows how to infect your computer, right? Um, the old sort of colloquial wisdom that, that Macs are more secure than Windows machines, whilst no longer while well, it's no longer completely true, there is still some truth to it. So we see far more attacks on Windows than we do on, on OS X, I guess what they're now calling Mac OS, but no one's immune, right? So most modern ransomware um, attacks will, will infect both kinds of devices. So step one is it gets onto your computer. Step two then, um, some ransomware will then use a command and control server, so they're actually linking, going out and talking to a, a command and control server on the on the web, from which they're getting instructions and getting encryption keys. Some others will work in offline mode. So we're going to talk about server later on here today. Server will work without a network connection, um, which means it you know will work on, for example, a laptop that's going on and off the network. And once that ransom is on your computer, there's generally sort of two paths that it takes. The first is uh, discovering other assets on the network that it can infect. Most commonly, this is going to be a shared network drive, right? Um, and the other, of course, is then attacking the, the local host that it's on, the laptop or the workstation. I think everybody on the call understands what it does on the laptop or the workstation. It starts to quietly encrypt away in the background and that eventually hits you with a ransom demand. But you know, what's more nefarious than that is when it will actually connect to other computers on the network and self-propagate or connect to, for example, a network share and start to encrypt that. Typically, data being stored on network shares is more important than data that's only stored on a laptop. Typically, it's shared content that everyone in the business needs access to. So typically, when the ransomware variants, you know, target uh, the shared network resource, they're actually 
going after a far higher value target, you know, than, than the data that would just be found on, say, the My Documents folder of, of a given employee's laptop. And so if we then sort of, oh, we've actually got an animated version of that same process. So, you know, ransomware comes in, infects a particular end user. Some point thereafter, that end user is going to get a ransomware demand. But more likely, prior to that, the ransomware has detected other resources on the network, whether it be databases or, or network shares, and, and or other users on the network, uh, and then self-propagated to those nodes. And of course, after some period of time, then they too are going to be hit with the ransomware demand. If during that period, um, data is being synced out to other your location, for example, through sync and share tools. That's another way that ransomware can actually replicate itself. And so it's, if left unchecked, modern variants can actually, just like you know, viruses and trojans of 10 years ago, will actually infect your entire network before it will then start the encryption process. Some headlines uh, that, that have caught our attention recently. Um, you know, so Madison County uh, had their servers fall victim to ransomware. Um, the, the new server variant, which actually targets databases, and so you know, one of the his, historically, or say historically, a year ago, people would say, "Oh, ransomware is not going to affect your database because your database file is always locked." Uh, you know, SQL Server or MySQL is talking to those things, and the process lock means that the data files can't be encrypted. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> you can kill process locks. So server will actually go through your process tree, find processes that are locking the database, and kill those processes, right? And it's, it's intelligent enough to do this across Oracle, MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. And after removing that exclusive lock on the, you know, on the MDF file, server will then go in and start to encrypt that database. Now, rule of thumb, if you can, you know, if you can take away a business's database, you've probably taken down a pretty important application, right? Um, so, you know, the server's a great example um, or a horrifying example of the way that these tools have become far more sophisticated, both at the way they, you know, they work technically, but also far more sophisticated in, in which part of the organization they're attacking. So, let's sort of turn the page then and talk about, well, what do we do as technical folks? What do we do about protecting our clients and or recovering our clients' data, you know, if and when a ransomware attack happens? And so the next few slides are really going to be all about sort of the two, you know, the, the two best ways to, to, to respond. Um, and for those of you who at the previous webinar, you remember I had a, a one, two, three step slide. The first step was get the machine off the network. The second step was determine when the attack occurred. And then when you get to step three, you've got, you know, you need to turn back time, as Andrew said at the top of the hour. And so how do you turn back time? Well, typically that means either um, paying the ransom, that's one way, you know, to get out of the scenario, not recommended, uh, but the other is to restore systems, right? And if you're going to restore systems, time is of the essence. A lot of people think that the damage inflicted by ransomware is the ransom itself. That's not the case. If you're a hospital and your servers have been infected by ransomware or one of your databases has been encrypted, the issue facing you is not the money you'll shell out to get the unlock key. It's the amount of time that your operations are going to be down, right? If that means you're going to be down for two or three days, that can have an enormous impact on your bottom line. Uh, so it's not the $1,000 or $5,000 you're going to shell out in Bitcoin. It's the downtime that you've really got to sweat. And this is where the distinction between DR and disaster recovery tools and backup tools really starts to come to life. So here on the slide, what's the difference between DRAS or DR as a service and backup? And really, it's all about that time to restore. Historically, uh, historically, you could sort of divide data protection into four buckets. You had high availability, which usually meant recovery in under a minute. Disaster recovery, which usually meant recovery in an hour or so. Uh, backup, which meant recovery in a couple of days, maybe 48 hours. And then archive, where recovery might, your RTO might be a week or more. Uh, these... The differences between these are really starting to munge together, right? And I'll unpack that in, 
as we go through these next few slides. But really boiling it down to its most basic and just comparing and contrasting backup and DR. At the top of this slide, we've sort of got the flow chart involved in how you recover from a ransomware attack using backup, right? So the green arrow means, you know, we're backing up, we're protecting systems, we're backing up. Then the disaster happens. In this case, the disaster is the ransomware attack. Then we go through this long restore process where we're copying data across a wire. We may be copying it from a disk array or from a tape array or from the cloud. But one way or another, restore implicates moving binary data over a wire, and that takes time. And then when that's complete, you can you know, boot up your applications, run them again, run SQL Server, connect it to its database, resume business operations. So that big long restore arrow there is actually the enemy because that represents hours or days, right? And as IT professionals, we should be aiming for zero downtime, right? We should be aiming to eradicate downtime. And that red bar represents business downtime. And so this is, the, this is classically known in data protection as the RTO, recovery time objective. If we can contrast that with disaster recovery, which is the flow chart at the bottom, with disaster recovery tools, generally speaking, I mean, you'll still be protecting systems. So you can see the green arrow at the front. I'm backing up, I'm protecting. Then the disaster happens. Then we're going to immediately fail over to a second set of nodes, whether that's locally or in the cloud or in a separate data center or a different building. But we're going to cut across the different infrastructure, and we're going to run that, that infrastructure and be back up and running typically in minutes, right? It could, be, could still be hours, frankly. Um, but the goal would be to be back up in minutes. And so if we just if we unpack that even further, let's take the example of the server in the heading of today's webinar and the server in the server example where servers come in and server has disconnected the database connections, unhooked the files, and then encrypted them. Let's talk about what it would take to get that database back online using backup versus using DRES. With backup, and again, this is an eye chart, so I apologize, so let me walk you through it. But the top here is step one, we detect the ransomware. Step two, power down the machine. Step three, determine the, the time or date of infection, right? And now we get into that recovery part where step four, we've got to rebuild the server. Now, this typically means having a standby server, um, installing the operating system and all the software, software required. Uh, maybe you've done this ahead of time. Maybe you haven't, right? Uh, if you haven't, certainly just getting that server up so that the, the appropriate software is installed, it's patched, and the database is ready to go can take time. Then the next step, step five, is reconfigure the database services. Um, step six, recover all of the database files from your backup system. And depending upon what that backup system is, this can take a lot of time. If it's cloud backup, for example, you've got to download all that data over the wire. So if you've got a slower internet connection, this can take many, many hours, right? If it's coming from an on-premise disk array, it's going to be a bit faster, but it's still going to take plenty of time. Step seven, once I've got those, the actual database files, and then going to inject them into the, you know, the, the new empty database instance. Step eight, try and reconnect to my application layers and, and see if they're, if they're working and debug that. Your best case total time for that flow is four or five hours. Very commonly, it's going to take a lot more than that, right? Uh, it can take 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, and so if we contrast that with DRAS, DR as a service, in DRAS, we've still got this similar steps at the beginning. We, did, you know, we get the ransomware infection, then we power down the, the machine that is causing the problem. We determine the time and date of the infection. But then things become very fast. Uh, we log into our DRAS dashboard. Right, so we go to a, a portal, and then we just boot the VMs necessary. And your DRAS solution should then fire up the machines that were affected, or fire up clones of them, I should say, uh, either locally on your premise or out in the cloud. And that whole process is going to take a minute or two. Right, and I'll talk, talk later about Infoscale specific offering, but we guarantee that this would take um, 15 minutes, and it normally takes about 90 seconds. So you're contrasting, um, you know, kind of two minutes with a worst case of 15 minutes in the case of DRAS versus 
the cloud backup row, which could take days, right? Um, and uh, Dave Hadsmer's just sent me a note. Um, Dave is one of the executives at AVG that we should we should insert a six A in between point six and seven on backup. Say a prayer and hope it works. And <laughs> whilst man is a joke, he's right. The failure rate when you're doing these reconfigurations and manually reconstructing your networks is huge. Um, invariably, you know these processes are being driven by stressed humans who are often doing this under enormous pressure, often doing it on, in suboptimal circumstances, like at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And invariably, things tend to go wrong. Um, I've been involved in a few sort of processes like this where you've got to recreate networks quickly, and things always go wrong. In fact, uh, we did a great webinar with Greg Brando. Greg Brando was CTO of Pixar, worked for Steve Jobs. And he tells a horror story where they had four different backup systems and through human error, the entire thing failed. And they lost Toy Story 2, billion dollar property. So for six weeks, production on the Toy Story 2 movie had to be stopped because of the very thing here that, that Dave's mentioning, that you know, human error can ruin the best of plans, right? Um, all right, so let's bang on. What to look for in a backup solution. So um, despite the fact that on the prior slide I sort of was negatively comparing and contrasting backup and DR, backup is, is still a must, right? So if, if you're not going to put a DR solution in place, which we think you should, and we'll show you soon how easy that is, you've definitely got to put a backup solution in place. And so things to look for in a backup solution include uh, anomaly detection, which I'll talk about more, but that's basically the idea of detecting when ransomware hits, unlimited versioning, your version history is very important. Because ransomware works over a period of time, it's not just a matter of rolling back to yesterday. You might actually need to roll back a few weeks, right? Um, obviously, you need endpoint protection. Many data protection and backup tools only work on the server, um, which is fine. It's good to have it on the server, but you also really need it on the endpoints, and that sometimes gets ignored. And then if we move on to what to look for in a disaster recovery solution, um, this is specific to sort of this new generation of DR tools called DRAS, DR as a service, sometimes pronounced DRAS. But um, DRAS is really sort of the latest incarnation of, of disaster recovery technology done in software using the cloud, right? Uh, and it's a new label being applied to this sector. Uh, Infrascale is, is a DRAS vendor. This is what we do. And so what you're looking for in a DRAS solution is, firstly, the ability to bring back your network both locally and somewhere else, right? Local for speed if it's a small failure, somewhere else if it's a macro failure. Uh, second really important thing is to look for someone who's going to guarantee your recovery time, the SLA. Uh, then, of course, you want someone who's going to protect both physical and virtual environments. You need enterprise features like built-in orchestration. This is the ability to bring up multiple servers and plumb them together with runbooks. Um, and then, lastly, absolutely you've got to make sure that you're encrypting the data end-to-end. -end. And I mentioned the anomaly detection feature. Just a quick screen cap. Um, most data protection systems can't help you at all in determining when a ransomware attack hit. They can help you roll back, but they can't tell you when it hit. Infrascale can. We've actually built some machine learning and artificial intelligence into our system that analyzes patterns and is getting smarter all the time. And through data change patterns can actually alert you to when you've been infected by ransomware. So not only are we going to help roll you back and save you at the time of a ransomware attack, we're actually going to help you figure out when it occurred. And this can be quite tricky because something like server might come into your network you know, today, but you may not get the ransom notice until Christmas Day, right? It can sit there dormant, self-propagate, encrypt, and do all of its bad stuff in the background, and you don't know. Why is that awful? Well, when you go to recover on Christmas Day, you don't know when to roll your network back to, right? And you don't want to roll it back to a state where it's still infected. Um, so this becomes actually kind of a big pain point. It's just identifying when the attack occurred, and we do that for you. In terms of how we stack up, uh, you might have heard of folks like Datto or Unitrends. Um, I'm not going to sort of go blow for blow, but some, some highlights. Uh, Infrascale has built-in anomaly detection. 
that on Unitrans don't really. Um, Infrascale's got really strong endpoint protection. Uh, on this slide, we actually we've got it filled in for Datto and Unitrans. Uh, it should really be sort of a half fill in that the Datto and Unitrans have very weak solutions when it comes to backing up endpoints. They're really more focused on just protecting your servers. Um, 15 minute failover. To me, this is the most important thing. At Infrascale, we guarantee that we'll bring you back in 15 minutes, and no one else in the market's doing this. Uh, and I'll talk, uh, I'll talk more about some of these things later, but for example, unlimited DR tests is also very important. As you are, you know, as you're rolling out DR across your network, you want to check that it works, right? So you want to be able to fail over to your DR vendor's location, verify everything's cool, and do this really regularly. And we allow you to do an unlimited number of these, uh, whereas data and unit transactions charge you for this as well. And then sort of one last case study before we go into some of the other material. Ellen McCree uh, at the University of Virginia has a great story. Uh, it's a scary story, but it's, it has a happy ending, right? So um, she was infected by ransomware, and in particular, they went after the financial systems, right? And she was running Infrascale, and we helped her roll back the entire thing with, with, within 90 minutes and get back up and running. And of that 90 minutes, the vast majority of it was her just waiting to get authority from her boss to do the rollback. Um, you contrast that with, say, the University of Calgary, who had a research department down for a month and ended up shelling out $18,000. And you've got a stark contrast of what it looks like when you're prepared. That's Ellen McCree, because um, she was running Infrascale versus you know, someone who wasn't prepared, University of Calgary, and the, the you know, amount of money they had to shell out. So we have our second poll here. Um, can you recover a production database in 15 minutes or less if it gets infected? So among your clients, for those running an Oracle server or a SQL server, right, any kind of business application that's sitting on top of a database, if that server blew up, or the building burned to the ground, or if it got locked up with ransomware, could you bring that entire application stack back up and running somewhere else in 15 minutes or less? And uh, this is an interesting question. I don't think we've ever asked this one before. Um, but you know, would you have to go through those seven steps that we talked about earlier, or could you just automatically bring this up at a second location? I'll give you a second here to answer that. All right, here are the results. Not surprisingly, most of you say, no, I couldn't bring my server back up in 15 minutes. Um, so that, 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 that tracks with what, what I thought you were going to say. Um, and so the good news for you all is that in the next few slides, we're going to learn about the solution that AVG and Infrascale together offer you where you know, we can guarantee that you can bring your clients back up in 15 minutes or less. Um, so let's turn now to how you as a, uh, a partner, how you as a technology reseller can work with your clients and become a ransomware hero. So I've talked about this before, but the first thing is really a shift in the way you engage with your customers on this and actually start to sell prevention services. So you're probably um, charging to manage your clients' networks and, hand and do incident response. One thing you can do and should do is start to actually sell proactive prevention services. And this doesn't just cover technology that you're going to put in. It's also going to cover time, right? Because, for example, the third bullet here, user training, is vitally important, right? So if you're going into your clients and saying, hey, look, I want to run a seminar with everybody about how to, how to check, how to detect and see these phishing attacks and how to respond, right? And actually doing a training like that is very, very valuable for your clients because it's still those, it's still uninformed end users that, that allow most attacks into the network. Um, another uh, sort of cool tool in, in this is um, doing a vulnerability assessment. So, excuse me, I'm going to jump forward a couple of slides here. We've actually built uh, this sort of survey quiz analysis tool called Are You a Soft Target for Ransomware? And it's a it's sort of a, a little survey you walk through, and you would walk your clients through this. And at the end of it, it will, it will give you an assessment of are you very high risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk. 
and then give you a, a list of solutions to, you know, suggestions on how to remediate. Now you can find this at areyouasofttarget.com. That website's just gone live. Um, we're going to be promoting it. Um, and uh, but if you go to areyouasofttarget.com, you'll see this quiz. Now this is a really cool resource to use with your clients. Right, sit them down, ask them a few questions, fill it in even for them. And it's going to give you a sort of a score grade of how, uh, what degree of risk does that individual client have. Using that, you can then you know, sell proactive services to them uh, and make sure they're adequately prepared. Uh, and along those lines, we've got a ton of resources that you can use. So here on screen are a couple of different screenshots of some assets we've got, um, whether it's a brief guide on how to mitigate ransomware, and I don't know if you can see at the top of that, it says logo here. So you can you can put your logo on this and use this material with your customers. Uh, the second one is your top ransomware defense strategies. Again, it's co-branded. Uh, so when you partner with Infrascale and AVG, we give you a ton of, of marketing materials and educational materials and, and content assets that you can use and take to your clients and stick your logo on it. Um, and so really recommend you, you sort of dig into this. If you're talking to an Infrascale rep, you can ask for access to this. Um, you can always email team at infrascale.com and ask questions if you've got them. So go check out areyouasofttarget.com um, and really think about what services could you add to your tool bag to sell your customers to get them more prepared for a ransomware attack. And with that, I'm going to segue into you know, a brief pitch about Infrascale because we think we are one of the best tools you can have in your tool bag to address the ransomware threat, right? So Infrascale is built on the premise that every modern company or every modern organization depends on data and uptime for their survival. That There are no exceptions to that. That the computing fabric that weaves this planet together has evolved such that Almost everything we do now is dependent upon a computer. When I watch television, I'm actually dealing with a Linux set-top box that's driving that. When I um, listen to music, it's digital. When I write an essay for college, it's, you know, it, it's digital. There's almost nothing we do these days, certainly in the knowledge economy, that isn't uh, digitally driven. Um, and uh, I've got a friend, for example, who's... Uh, big in agriculture. I grew up on a farm. He's running a farm. And believe it or not, the entire, but a, a large parts of the farm are now automated and being run by a computer. So even parts of the old economy, agriculture, is now becoming dependent upon on computing systems. And yet computing vendors have done an awful job of making themselves hardened and resilient, right? So the, the Apples and the Microsofts and the IBMs of the world have, have made enormous leaps forward in terms of making us more and more dependent upon computers, haven't done a great job of making sure those computers don't fail. I, I always analogize to the motor car industry. It's, it's like they've built us a car that can go at 1,000 miles an hour but doesn't have any brakes or airbags in it, right? Um, and so downtime remains this huge problem. It actually, the economists actually say that it impacted the U.S. economy last year negatively to the tune of $100 billion dollars that the US economy lost $100 billion because of computer system downtime. And, and that's despite the fact that we spent $12 billion on systems trying to defend against downtime. Now this year, when the stats come out, I'm sure it's going to be larger. Just, just think about the, the Delta outage, right? A computer in Florida fails and 3,200 flights got grounded. Uh, think about the, the Southwest outage. Uh, you know, a computer in Arizona failed and 1,100 flights got grounded. Um, that coupled with the ransomware threat sort of really starts to throw into stark relief this, thing, this, this fact that we have a pandemic of system failure and computer downtime that is doing real damage to our businesses. So with that sort of backdrop, Infrascale's mission is a lofty one. Our goal is to eradicate downtime and data loss. And you've got to do both. You can't just protect the data. You've got to protect the systems as well. And so our solution is that we guarantee that we'll bring your systems back up and get them running in 15 minutes or less at a fraction of the cost of competitive solutions. Um, so we have this incredibly advanced platform, but it's incredibly affordable. In fact, with recent benchmarkings, you know, we, we are more than five times faster than IBM's 
big boy solution and we're less than a fifth of the price point, right? Which gives you a sense of sort of tremendous value we're bringing to the market. And so when we talk about data, data protection, we're delivering sort of three key things to you as a, as a partner. Uh, ransomware protection, as we've talked about here today, cloud backup and recovery tools that you can use for all of your clients, and then push button failure and disaster recovery for uh, the, the more important data assets. So when I say more important data assets, what am I talking about? Well, we've got this, so we created this slide, we call it data value pyramid, but we believe that generally any organization can split its data into four buckets. One is endpoints. Second is remote office and branch office data, you know. Um, so the third then is your core data center. And then within the core data center, your mission critical applications. So if we were to take a, let's take a, a, a small hospital. Uh, endpoints are gonna be the laptops and tablets that all the employees have, might have 500 of those. Remote office and branch office, this might be the clinics where, you know, the, the family, family doctors work or the blood lab, you know, where they're doing testing work. Core data center is what it sounds like. It's probably in the basement of the hospital, and that's where all the server infrastructure is centrally located, and then mission critical. That's going to be the ERP or the EPIC database that's at the core of hospital operations. And if the EPIC goes down, the entire hospital network is down. So we typically recommend, well, firstly, our observation is that normally the top two rows of this pyramid are protected, right? There's few hospitals out there that aren't protecting their core data center. But the bottom two rows, the remote office and branch office and endpoints, are usually not protected. So when you're going into your clients and you're thinking about your client's infrastructure, map their infrastructure to this. Are they protecting everything or are they only protecting some of the data? And then when you, when you work with InfraScale, we give you everything you need to solve this. We, we generally recommend our DRAS solution for the top two rows, the mission critical and the core data center. And then we recommend it to go cloud backup for the bottom two rows. But the important point is you work with us, it's a one-stop shop, you get everything you need in the solution. And so um, what are the differences? Well, a cloud backup tool is a distributed endpoint product which will protect both Macs and Windows machines, backs up directly to the cloud, you can recover your data in seconds, everything's encrypted end-to-end, -end, and it's got that ransomware detection and alerting built in. So very important to give you that early warning of a ransomware infection on the network. Then there's the InfraScale DRAS offering, or DR as a service. And this is where the goal is to be able to push a button and bring back two servers, 20 servers, or 200 servers within 15 minutes or less, and we guarantee that. And because we're so disruptive in this space, because we're you know five times faster than IBM at a fifth of the price, we started to get some real industry recognition. So the Gartner Group, you may be familiar with, they're the world's leading IT analyst firm recently called as their top visionary for disaster recovery, right? And so, um, you know, the, again, there's a bit of an eye chart, but the Gartner Magic Quadrant sort of separates the market into four buckets. The leaders, which are typically the big companies like the IBMs and the Microsofts, um, the, the challenges, the niche players, and the visionaries. And we're at the top of the visionary quadrant because what we're doing really is uh, disruptive. We want to work with you to future-proof your business and protect your clients so that you can sell to your customers 15-minute guaranteed recovery, right, as part of that overall prevention services package we were talking about earlier. Where do we run? Almost everywhere. So we protect all the major form factors, whether that's mobile devices, desktops and laptops, physical servers, or virtual servers. And that's very important. Many vendors specialize. So if you're using a Druva, they really just do desktops and laptops. If you're using a Datto, they really just focus on Windows physical servers. If you're using a Veeam, they really focus on virtual, whereas we've decided that we would support all four. And then from an OS coverage perspective, there's more than 100 versions of the major operating systems we support. So with laptops, you can't just cover Windows. You've also got to do you know, Mac. With physical servers, you can't just focus on Windows. You've also got to protect Linux and Unix. In virtual land, these days, it's not good enough to just support VMware. You've got to support Hyper-V as well. Um, and we think that's really important to our partners who we often dealing with a patchwork quilt of infrastructure among their clients. In terms of cloud support, we're very flexible. So InfraScale itself runs a cloud network, which you can use. We have data centers in Europe, so if uh, you're sensitive about where your data is going to uh, stay, we'll, if you're in Germany, we'll keep it in Germany. If you're in the United Kingdom, we'll keep it in the United Kingdom. We know that's very important. 
Alternatively, you can choose your own cloud. So if, if you're more comfortable using Amazon, then our technology will work with Amazon or Google or IBM. Um, you can also run private cloud. So if you're already running a data center for your customers, that's cool. Keep running a data center for your customers, but you can use our technology. From a compliance standpoint, um, you know, we've done a lot of work to really make sure uh, that our solution complies with all of the major frameworks, whether that's HIPAA, SSIE 16, which is the, the replacement for SOX 2, um, the EU Data Protection Directive, and there's been a lot of activity recently about uh, the replacement for the safe, safe harbor regime. It's imp I know we've got a lot of European partners on the call, so let me emphasize. Our European customers' data stays in Europe, right? We've got data centers on the continent as well as in the United Kingdom. Just to give you a sense of scale, um, every red dot here represents a business being protected by InfraScale. Uh, there's 55,000 companies being protected with more than a million devices. We're active in 172 countries, which makes us roughly the same size as the United Nations from number of countries. Uh, we've got 900 partners around the world. So it's, this is certainly a solution that scales. This is certainly a solution that's proven. All right, and so, we're going to get to the Q&A here in one second, but before we do that, we've got one last poll. Would you like to learn about InfraScale's backup and disaster recovery solutions? This could be anything from getting a free evaluation unit to you can test it in your network to getting a guided tool by one of our sales engineers to us sending you some of the marketing material and the educational ransomware content for your clients. But do let us know if you'd like to learn more, um, and I'll leave this survey here on the screen for a hot second. Also remember to check out um, areyouasofttarget.com. There's some great resources there. Okay, and so I'll, let's go um, to next steps. Well, ransomware really is the number one cybersecurity threat facing companies. And you, you've got to choose you know, a real business grade solution either on the backup side or for DRAS, DR as a service, because it's your number one defense, right, against a ransomware breach. Um, we can deliver both to you in one simple, elegant package, but even if you don't work with us, I implore you to go out and get yourself a, a DRAS solution where you can push a button and recover within 15 minutes. When we did the survey earlier, 93% of you said you couldn't recover that database in 15 minutes. Uh, well, we're here to tell you that the technology is out there now at an affordable price point that means you can. So it's really your responsibility to go and get that for your clients, right? We feel passionately about that. So whether it's us or someone else, please do do that. And now we're going to go to the Q&A. Um, so just a reminder, we're giving away these doodads uh, to the, the person who asked the most questions. Uh, so find the Q&A tool. Um, and I think Andrew's going to moderate this for us. And, and while he does that, I'm just going to throw that last poll question back up on screen uh, and leave it there. So uh, if, folks, if folks do want to get follow-up, then um, you can just choose that right here. Andrew, are you there, mate? I am. So we have a lot of questions come in. Uh, we've got some from the UK. Do we have actual people on the ground in the United Kingdom? Absolutely. Um, so both AVG and Ipriscale have actual real humans um, in the United Kingdom uh, that can come and meet with you and talk with you. Um, I can't speak for where the AVG folks are located, but our guys are in London. Um, you know, they sort of regularly make their, their trip around the aisles. Um, and we've also got people on the continent. Um, so, uh, yes. Okay, um, there's a, a deeper one on ransomware. On one of the slides, there was information that Lockheed can get access to resources that you have not access to. Can you explain how that works? Sure. So um, in Windows networks, files have got this thing called ACL, the access control list associated with them. And those ACLs will, uh, can typically be used to say, for example, that if you're a member of Group X, then you can open this file. If you're a member of Group Y, you can't. Well, ransomware doesn't obey those rules. Right? Ransomware comes in and usually um, installs its root privileges. Just reading this morning an article on, on the way server can actually infect your computer and how it completely, well, it attempts to completely bypass the user access controls. Um, all of that means that regardless of whether or not you as a, as a user 
have the permissions to access a file, you can bet that these ransomware tools are going to try and target uh, those files. Um, and so because they're, in, they're installing themselves with root privileges where they can, they've generally got access to everything. Okay, we've got one that uh, dives quite deep into uh, the technology. How does Infrascale perform disaster recovery as a service on SMB using only NAS, not Windows servers? Most companies in Hong Kong use multiple storages, including network address storage. So how does Infrascale perform DRAS on SMB using only NAS? Yeah, so um, that's not a problem, so long as when we set up um, the tool, as long as we capture the data that's on the NAS, we'll be able to fail that over as part of the failover. So it's really just a matter of setup. Um, most, you know, it's a good question that most DRAS tools, or well, some DRAS tools, I should say, don't actually extend to supporting NAS devices, but ours does. Great. Um, next one here is, Infrascale looks very good for enterprise-scale businesses. However, there are millions of more small businesses, you might call them tiny, compared to massive enterprises. So I have to scroll here. For whom a ransomware infection could be just as bad or a scale for... Oh. Okay, I'm missing the rest of the question. Okay, uh, this is well, from I think this, uh, this... Andrew Gordon. Andrew... Sorry, go ahead, Ken. I think the tenor of the question is, um, is this solution any good for small businesses or micro businesses, right? Um, and I think the answer is absolutely yes. Both AVG and Infrascale work very hard to take best of breed solutions that are used by big companies, but make them affordable enough for very small businesses and make them easy enough for very small businesses. So the Infrascale solution absolutely scales down to a small business or a very small business environment. Okay, the next one here is, can you explain orchestration, bracket, run books, run books? What is this? Sure thing. So when you're bringing back that server, you know, and before we looked at that eight-step flowchart, oftentimes it's not just one server that you want to bring back up and running. Usually if you've got a complex application, it might involve four or five or ten servers. And that means that you would be going through that seven-step process for four or five or ten servers. What, what orchestration is talking about is automating all of that so that we won't, when we push the failover button, we're not just going to bring up one server, we're going to bring up all of the servers in the application cluster, connect them to each other, network, everything else, right? So it's basically automating and taking the manual steps out of everything involved in, in recovery. So a run book could be as simple as, okay, bring up the web server, then bring up the application server, then bring up the database server, then check this service or this web page to verify everything's working, and then return, you know, return a happy result, right? That orchestration is vital when you're dealing with more than just one or two servers. Okay. Uh, next one is, do you have any co-marketing programs built into your partner program, or are we on our own? Tons of co-marketing material. So, um, actually, on one of the slides we looked at earlier, I showed sort of three different resources you can co-brand. But in our partner resource um, portal, we have, I've got at this point, 50, 60, 70 different assets that you can use, everything from email marketing to webinar templates to brochures to ransomware educational materials. So, yes, there's an enormous amount of material that you can leverage when you work with us. Perfect. Uh, next one is about security. How does your cloud solution deal with security slash encryption of data in transit and within the data center? Uh, it's based on what's called double-blind encryption. So basically, we encrypt data before it leaves your office, right? And then it comes over the wire to us via an encrypted connection. Then when it gets to us, we encrypt it again with a different set of keys and store it that way. So it's generally data is being stored with two separate encryption wrappers, which makes it far less likely that anybody can, can crack the encryption, right? It's not just one layer of encryption they've got to crack, it's two. Ah, okay, Here, here's a tricky one I think you've had before. Is encrypted data, i.e. cloud storage, is it safe from ransomware, or can encrypted data be further encrypted by ransomware? 
uh, encrypted data can be encrypted again. Um, so sure. So if if you're talking about you've got some encrypted files on your local disk, like and you're using like a TrueCrypt volume, ransomware can still come along and steal that from you uh, and wrap it up in another encryption bubble and hold you to ransom. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, many of them, this is not my question. This has come from somebody else, I promise you. Many small businesses probably cannot afford disaster recovery as a service. So what is the best we can do for them? Tape backup? Cloud backup? So the suggestion uh, is that CRAS is not affordable for the small business. Yeah, so... Um, I think this, this came from Andrew Gordon. So Andrew, look, that certainly used to be true. It's not true with folks like Infrascale, right? So Infrascale costs about the same amount as you know a tape backup solution. Um, we're incredibly affordable. So if anybody on the line is thinking, oh, this is too expensive for me, you really ought to uh, talk to us. Um, you know, pricing starts at less than $150 per terabyte per month, everything included. Like everything included. Uh, we're actually less expensive than a data or Unitrans solution, but deliver you know, fundamentally higher performance. So because we're leveraging the cloud and because we're using you know, smart software instead of dumb hardware, uh, our price points are surprisingly low. And that's kind of our whole mission, right? We want to sort of take the best practices from big companies and give them to the little guy. Um, so you should absolutely talk to us um, and price this out. I think you'll find it's totally affordable for your SMB clients. Okay, next question is, is tape data safe from ransomware? Uh, the answer is it depends. Depends how you're set up. Generally speaking, any data that's tethered physically to your local device or your local network is at risk for ransomware. Okay. When it comes to, uh, to uh, disaster recovery as a service, it is quite common to encounter activation issues regarding Windows servers. Has Infrascale encountered such? Uh, the client did have problems with uh, VM for clients, and this happens a lot. That's a great question. Um, and the answer is no, we actually solved for that. So this is very annoying, and just for the other folks on the line, you know, when if you've got a physical Windows server and you're snapshotting it, right, for DR purposes, when you boot it back up somewhere else, sometimes you've got to go through Windows activation again. Um, I think, yeah, this is from George. So George, when we capture the server, we make certain to capture all of the licensing information with it, and we'll actually, we, we make certain that all that licensing information is carried over to the cloud clone. And because we've then got boot verification, you can even check this for yourself if you like, but, but we do all of this um, for you. So that's a good question, and we do handle that, yeah. Okay, next question is, uh, does the 15-minute failover guarantee apply to the UK, or is this just a US service level agreement? It absolutely applies to the UK and the continent and anywhere else Infoscale um, serves markets. Um, are, I think I'll skip that. Uh, the, is the ABG CloudCare antivirus product as fully features as the non-CloudCare internet security product? So that's my, my question. Uh, yes, it is. The AV engine that runs within CloudCare is the same AV engine that runs within the internet security products. What you must do on both products, if you're running the internet security, you must have auto update turned on to make sure the updates are streamed, and therefore the endpoint is protected with the latest version. With CloudCare, you need to make sure you're pushing out the latest version of the definition, the latest version of the agent, and that way you'll have the same protection on both sides. Um, we have a follow-up to the tape question. Following the tape question, aside from tape backups copy encrypted data, can the data on a tape be encrypted once it is on a tape? So obviously if the tape's been removed from the jukebox, then no. But a lot of modern tape systems are actually set up so the tapes will be left in, you know, in the system with read-write privileges and actually be, um, actually sort of have what looks like 
disk access via LTFS. And if that's the case, yes, they can be encrypted, and yes, the data can be overwritten, and yes, the data can be corrupted, and that's exactly what hit Greg Brando at Pixar. Not, not ransomware in that particular case, but the modification of data that they thought was immutable on tape. So just because it's on a tape system doesn't mean you're safe from ransomware. It, it depends how it's set up. Okay. Um, Mr. Nijiwan, where are your European data centers? Yeah, we've got three at the moment. So one in Germany, one in the United Kingdom, and one in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Okay, and that takes us to the top of the hour. We have a couple more questions here. We'll have to follow up uh, offline. Um, I think it's time, Ken, for you to announce uh, the lucky winner of one of those prizes. Yes, indeedy. Uh, the, the, the winner of the prize today is Andrew Gordon. Uh, so, Andrew, if you can um, type into the questions box the best phone number and email address to reach you on, uh, we'll be in touch and you can pick uh, which one of those you those prizes you would like us to send you, whether it's the Parrot Drone or the Xbox or the Apple TV. Um, so, yeah, just type in a question with your details there and we'll be in touch. Congratulations, Andrew. Thanks for your great questions. Uh, so, Ken, thank you very much for delivering the webinar today. This is part two of three. There will be a follow-up email. We'll give you a link back to the recording of this webinar and a reminder of part three, which is coming up in early December. So thank you very much. Uh, I've got a full page of notes that I made from the presentation, and I look forward to part three in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now.